My uh, theory, I haven't read this anywhere, but my theory is that one of the reasons that worship music became popular in Christianity, but not just Christianity, in, in the Jewish faith as well, is because the truth of the Word of God was so important. P early Christians like King David recognized that you can memorize Scripture better if you put it to music, right? Do you remember being in school and your teachers? I, I remember learning the 50 states with a song way back when I was young. I still could say it. it they just so burned it in, Alabama, Alaska, Arizona. But by having the, the melody to it, it causes you to remember it better. So I really think that a lot of the reason people come out with these songs is because it comes as a result of their personal time with God. And as they're meditating on the Word and just memorizing Scripture, they put it to, to a tune, and then they remember the tune, and then that, then that verse just keeps rolling over in your spirit. It's very powerful, isn't it? Say yes, please. Let me know you're here. It's very powerful. And it could also be powerful if you were listening to Led Zeppelin back in the day, like I was, because then it's the wrong thing that's rolling around in your spirit. And it's, and it's birthed in witchcraft, and it's birthed in the wrong spirit. And a lot of people have committed suicide because they were listening to the wrong thing in their brain over and over and over. And you know, the longer you keep listening to a lie, the more it sounds like the truth. So you really need to offset that lie with the truth of the Word of God. And, the reason I mention that is because I first learned this verse through a song. I don't even think, I, I was a young Christian. I don't even know that if, I knew it was a verse. I just heard them singing and I didn't know if it was just a lyric or if it was a verse. And the way I heard it was the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will set you free from the law of sin and death. And I thought I stopped at the law of the spirit. The more I've studied this, the more I've come to realize I put the comma in the wrong place. It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ. See, that's one big law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ. That's what sets you free from the law of sin and death. And this word law is no joke, right? Like the law of gravity. I could step off this step and say, I curse you, law of gravity, but without a miracle, it's going to pull me down, isn't it? Because it doesn't care whether I believe it's true or not. It's a law. But then there's another law called lift that if I was going fast enough, the law of gravity takes second place to the law of lift. And that's why you can fly in a plane. <laughs> so the law of death is what we inherited when we were born, right? You know this. This is pretty basic Christianity 101. We're all born with original sin. And unless we get saved, we're going to die in that sin. And there's a punishment for that. The wages of sin is death. But the good news is that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets you free from the law of sin and death. And they're at odds with each other. And in our flesh, we're going to gravitate towards, what, death and sin. But by the spirit of God living inside of us, we gravitate towards life. So really, if I had to summarize what I'm going to talk about today and the different verses I'm going to use, that would be the theme is that we're continually contesting and contending between which one is going to win in our life. Because just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you never sin. You have to yield yourself to the Lord's rulership over your life, don't you? Say yes, church. <laughs> Not going to be a condemning message. It's actually really good news. It's, it's that there is an answer. You know how Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing. Who's going to deliver me from this mess? And the answer was Jesus. And Jesus resurrecting allowed Holy Spirit to be released from heaven 50 days later on the day of Pentecost. And now all of us have this supernatural power residing in us. If we don't yield to it, it doesn't just automatically take over. So we have to yield to the Spirit's power in us and the truth of the Word, and we have to take second place to God's rulership. That's why he's the king of kings. All of us are priests and kings, but he's our king. He has final say. And that's really good news because the world doesn't know that. They think they have to do it their own way. And I like the voice version, which I guess you're seeing now. That's awesome. Thank you, Booth. Another group of people that bail me out on a regular basis. <laughs> Thank you, Booth, people, <laughs> my peeps in the booth. <laughs> he says, when you live in the anointed one, Jesus, isn't that a great phrase? Are you living in the anointed one, Jesus? 
Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're living in it. Because if you, I remember being in a Bible study with a men's group from work, and the guy said before the Holy Spirit became real to him, he used to go to work in the morning and say, okay, he would read the scripture in his car, and then when he got out of his car, he'd say, okay, God, goodbye, I'll see you at 5 o'clock when I leave work. <laughs> see, I got the revelation that God wanted to be with him, even at the job, right? But living in the anointed one means he goes wherever we go. And that we know he's a very present help no matter what we're doing. And, and it's just really, frankly, pride often that can stop that from happening. Because uh, in the American culture, at least, we think having to ask for help is a sign of weakness. And especially men, I think, are taught that. I certainly was taught that. As a football player, I was drilled to know the difference between an injury and pain. <laughs> All the football players are getting triggered right now. And clearly, it was only pain. You were never really injured, the coach would say. It's just pain, and you have to learn how to deal with pain. If you're going to be a man, you learn how to deal with pain. If it was really an injury, okay, maybe we'll give you a day off. <laughs> That's a lie, brother. That's a lie. But look, you know, like you buy into that, and you think somehow being a man means not having to ask for help. That's a blatant lie. We're supposed to be asking God for help all the time. Not only is that not a sign of weakness, that is a sign of the greatest strength because it means you're living in the anointed one. Nothing he doesn't care about. Everything that's important to you is important to him. There's nothing you can go to him with where he'd say, oh, please stop bothering me. He never slumbers or sleeps. Isn't that amazing? Oh. So when you live in the anointed one, Jesus, a new law takes effect. You're not bound by the one you were born into, death. A new law takes effect. The law of the spirit of life breathes into you and liberates you from the law of sin and death. And what does breathing into you remind you of? Genesis, right? God made man out of dirt, and he breathed into that dirt and life, animated life. He came alive because of that. And someday in this world, our breath is going to leave us, which means we're going to die, but we're going to be resurrected again. We're going to rule and reign with Christ in a resurrected body with no pain and no disease and no decline. So we have this mission while we're here to make the most of what we have while we're here. And this is our turn. You know, that's what you could say. We, we sat here Friday night and we watched uh, the... I can't remember it now. Sight and Sound. Sorry, I couldn't remember the name of the place. They did a great production of a movie. How many came? It was a blessing, right? Make some noise if you liked it. Don't let the mass stop you from making noise. <laughs> but it went all the way back to the 1800s and 1900s. That was their turn. See? They're gone now. 50 years from now, I'm probably going to be gone. I hope not, but you know, at some point, unless Jesus returns, I'm not depressed by that. I'm going to make the most of the turn that I have right now. And we can all say that. Isn't this awesome? It's the great equalizer. It's not based on your IQ or your family background. You're a Christian. And the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And you can do great exploits for the kingdom of God. And God isn't measuring us one against the other, is he? Often we think that he is. He's not. You can think of the talents, right? The parable of the talents. One got two, one got one, one got five. Anybody remember this? The one that got five, yeah, there's two different parables. I'm thinking of the one that got five made ten, the one that got two made four, and the one that had one talent did what? Well, he didn't make much of his chance, did he? He didn't realize it was his turn. He said, I knew that you were a harsh man, so I hid it so that I wouldn't lose it. And he was rebuked for that, wasn't he? So we can't stand before the Lord when we see him and say, well, I was afraid I'd mess it up so I didn't try. I'm going to leverage the opportunity that you give me. I might not be very good at it, but it's not going to be because I'm not trying. I'm going to live in the anointed. And I'm going to ask you, Lord, to breathe into me. When you live in the anointed one, a new law takes effect, and it's the spirit of life that breathes into you and liberates you from the law of sin and death. And when that's very active in your life, you're contagious with that life. And the people you're talking to and the people you come in contact with, something like what happened this morning, a word of knowledge about knees. 
David hasn't had pain in his knees, and all of a sudden he got pain in his knees, and you're like, well, where's that in the Bible? Look, you know, God speaks to us because he loves us. He's our children. And that's called the word of knowledge. So God can do that in, a, in an infinite amount of ways that he could show us, that he's speaking to us. And I know most of you that have been a Christian any length of time know that there's many stories you could tell when you knew it was the Lord because it had to be the Lord, right? So we don't have to go there. I trust David. You all should trust him too. If he says he feels the Lord prompt him in a certain direction, receive the healing of your knees. I mean, if they were going to change my name, I would like it to be Neil. Because <laughs> right? then you're always thinking about kneeling down and praying, right? Like, that'd be a good new name to have, wouldn't it? Because that's what God wants. He wants us living in the anointed one. And look, praying doesn't mean that you have to, you know, set yourself aside. It's good to do that, but you could be praying in any situation that you're in. You could be talking to God and inviting him into your situation. That's part of what living in him means. So Trisha quoted Isaiah 9, 6. It's a, a very common verse to read in uh, Christmas season. But I wanted to see where it's, I want you to see that it's related in the New Testament. And, you know, Matthew was probably the most uh, oriented toward the Hebrew language and, and the Jewish culture as he was writing the New Testament. And, and this is what Matthew writes in Matthew chapter 4. He was quoting from Isaiah chapter 9, just a couple of verses before what Trisha quoted. She quoted verse 6. I'm going to start in Isaiah 9.1, which, by the way, was 700 years when Isaiah got the prophecy before Jesus was born, okay? So, long time. But this is what Isaiah prophesied, and it's quoted in Matthew 4.15, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And I highlighted that for you to, to put the focus on the Gentiles, okay? Because Isaiah was alive, the, the Galilee region was not known as a Jewish community. So that is where Jesus ended up camping out for quite a bit of his ministry. But at the time Isaiah was given the prophecy, there wasn't a heavy Jewish influence there. And he's saying, even there, using it as an example of an ungodly place, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. <laughs> and boy, is that true. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, they would have known that shadow of death, right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? You are with me. So even though other people are fearing, I know you're with me. I don't have to be afraid when I know that you're with me. A light has dawned to those people who were in that region. And Jesus said, keep, very next verse, keep turning away from your sins and come back to God. For heaven's kingdom realm is now accessible. That's, that's the Passion Translation, and I really would encourage you to think through what this means. Because sin has been accepted in our culture, and if you try to call sin out according to the Bible definition, you're labeled as somebody who hates other people. Because everybody should just be able to do whatever they want. That's part of freedom. You know, our culture is built on freedom. And it's true that people are allowed to do whatever they want. But if we're going to call ourselves Christians, then we want to use this as a standard that we have rules and there's boundaries in here for our own good. And that's because God loves us. And he knows better than we do, doesn't he, church? Because that's what it meant. They were sitting in darkness, but now they've seen a great light. And darkness and sin go hand in hand. And light and life of Jesus go hand in hand too. So we come out of that. And then once we come out of it as Christians, now here's this contending that goes on. The enemy's still going to try to pull us into sin. And we're going to strengthen ourselves in the Lord, like King David did, remember? He strengthened himself in the Lord. We're going to pull on that promises of God, repeat them, worship, sing songs, remind ourselves, keep it on the front burner of our minds, the word of God, invite Holy Spirit to every situation. And it doesn't mean we're perfect, but the odds of you listening and, and paralleling and sinking your life with God's will increase dramatically when you live in that anointing with the Holy One. You invite him in. And then I realize, he tells me, keep turning away from your sins. And, and often, if, if we're bound by a sin, it's because there's a weakness in our life, and it's a besetting sin. Remember that verse in Hebrews? 
It's a besetting sin. Mine might be different from yours, right? There's some general things that we could think about. Like for men, pornography in general tends to be a, a, an area where they can fall. Um, but doesn't mean that, that one person falls with, into the same category as another because there's, we're all made up differently, right? But the enemy tries to find that place where he can get in and keep you doing those besetting sins. So there's some structure that we've been living our life on that makes us think that the counterfeit is better than the real thing. And we go back to that counterfeit, and then the devil brings shame, and he accuses us about it. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from that law of sin and death. So I can keep bringing that to the Lord and saying, Lord, I repent of that. You said in Matthew 4, 17, I can keep turning away from my sins and come back to you, for your kingdom realm is accessible. You can give me the tools that my natural flesh doesn't have. You can give me the tools I need to not keep repeating that destructive behavior. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. Nothing's too hard for God. Thank you, Terry Willis. That's the name of her song, right? There's nothing he can't do. All right, Isaiah 9.4. I'm going back to Isaiah now from Matthew. This is so good. After, after 1 and 2, which we just read by the Sea of Galilee, those who sat in darkness will see a great light. Isaiah 4 then says, you have broken, speaking to God, you've broken the chains that have bound your people. You've lifted off the heavy bar across their shoulders. The rod the oppressor used against them. You have shattered all their bondage. That's prophetic. You can claim this verse. Whatever that besetting sin, if you're saying, I just haven't been strong enough to stop that thing, that's okay. Because God's power is greater than our ability. And look, it's my turn. Some point in the future, it's not going to be my turn anymore. My turn's going to be over. So I'm going to try to make the best of my turn that I can. And, you know, part of that is also being in sync with my wife. Because that's the most important person in my life. Other than my relationship with God, that's it. And if that's not going well, I better focus on that if I expect my relationship with God to be working well. Right? If, I, if I'm strong this way, it should also reflect in strong this way too, right? And that's my priority. That was the covenant commitment I made. I said, till death do us part, for better or for worse. It's all been better, hon, I promise. But there was no worse. But in, in case there was some worse in there, it's, it's still my number one thing. That's, that's part of this. It says it's a covenant, right? It's not some casual thing. It's sacred. Marriage is sacred. So focus on it. Make it a priority in your life. I don't mean to get off on that tangent. I'm just saying this is part of why staying in the Word is so important. So you don't let the culture shift your priorities. Oh, he lifted off the heavy bar across our shoulders. And if you were bound by some kind of sin, like for me it was drug addiction before I got saved, that's how it felt. Like the boss said jump and you said how high. Right? You were a slave to that thing. You couldn't control it. Tried every program known to man. Nothing lasted. I could do it in my own willpower for only so long. And then something would happen in my life to bring stress, like you know what you probably have heard me talk about. It was 40 years ago. This coming Tuesday will be 40 years ago that my uncle was murdered. And that was a very profound, damaging thing that happened to me in my life. And I didn't have the tools to know how to deal with it. I was that guy sitting in darkness. And then I, I met Jesus and I saw the great light. And he took me out of that really depression to the point, I don't want to go into all the details of it, but things can happen in our lives that create a, a poor in spirit, right? I was poor in spirit. I was depressed. Something happened that I had no grid for. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't process it. My life dramatically changed in one moment. It was a Monday night, December 20th, 1980. I'm sorry, December 22nd, 1980. And uh, I had left work. Our family had a big trucking business, and I had left work to go home. And then the phone rang when I got home, and they said, you got to come back to the office. There's been, a, I think they said, an accident. And when I got back to the office, I lived in Union. I had to go to Elizabeth. Uh, I saw my uncle's dead body in the front seat of a car. He had been murdered right in front of our office. My father worked next, they, they were at the same, in the same office. My father heard the shot, had come outside, and saw the man pull away. So, uh, again, without going into all the details of that, it, it was a very profoundly damaging thing that happened to me because my whole life had been 
assumed that that's, that would be the career trajectory that I would be on. And when I saw what happened, I didn't have enough knowledge about why something like that would have happened. And I just spun, I just spun down. Right? I, was, I was this slave that had a heavy bar across my shoulders. And what you do when you're depressed often is you turn to the counterfeit affections that the devil offers because the pain is too strong, so you want to numb your pain. It's the worst thing you can do because then it compounds the pain. And then you're, you're caught in that trap of the enemy, right? And it was only through a witness of my mother walking through the same tragedy with us. She was in just as much pain, maybe more, than me because she knew my uncle even better than I did and knew what a key person he was. And yet, because she was saved, there was a different peace about her than anything that I'd ever seen before. And it was a really very present help in her time of trouble. I didn't know the language of that then, but she was walking through the same situation with an equal amount of pain, but had another set of tools to deal with that. And the girl that I thought I was going to marry saw what happened, and she didn't want anything to do with me anymore. And in a way, I couldn't blame her. I mean, you know, it's front page news. It looked like a, it was a mob hit, right? So, like, really, you're going to marry the mob? I don't think so. But I didn't see it that way at all. I was a young guy, you know, at the time. So, point is, that could happen to anybody at any time. Life can just deal you a hand that you have no grid for, and that's where this time to seek the Lord really matters, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. When you're in that broken place, the kingdom of God's available to you. You didn't have to qualify it by your good works. It's accessible to you. And man, this is such great language. Verse 5, after telling them that God has shattered the bondage of the enemy... Every boot of marching troops and every uniform cake with blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. All right? So you want to know that translated into my life? Once I got saved, which took a while after that, two years actually, before I actually surrendered my will, the Lord was working on me that whole time. If you've ever heard the Holy Spirit called the hound of heaven, <laughs> like he's tracking you down and he won't let go and that was, that's what would happen to me he was just tracking me down so finally it was two years later when I finally surrendered and the war for me was the music that's why I quoted Led Zeppelin earlier right because you know I didn't even realize when I first got saved that I wasn't supposed to listen to that music and then my mother one day came in and said what's the name of that song you're listening to this was by the Grateful Dead actually it's called Friend of the Devil <laughs> That was the name of the song. you think I would have caught on, right, as a Christian. But I was so used to singing it, it never it even dawned on me. And she said, you're no friend of the devil, you're a Christian now. Like, you know, just common sense, right? So I, I called up the foreman of the garbage truck company, and I took boxes of my albums and met the garbage truck, and I dumped them in the, in the back of that truck. <laughs> See, that's what this verse is talking about. Everything the enemy tried to use against you, you're going to put it in the fire, and you're going to burn it, and it's not going to be available to be even used against you anymore. The boots, the uniforms that are covered with blood, the war's over. It's gone now. You're not going back to that thing. Because once you've tasted the real thing, the counterfeit is exposed as a counterfeit. Yeah. And pornography is exactly that. It's a counterfeit. And I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just saying the, the weapons of our warfare are greater to fight that thing. They're not carnal. But they're mighty through God to demolish the stronghold. If ever there was a counterfeit, it's pornography. It's giving you a stimulation without any of the reality of the relationship and without any of the commitment. We break that power now in Jesus' name. There's a greater force among us than the force of the enemy's lies. Jesus, please take over, Lord. Take over our lives. And that's when Isaiah says the reason that every uniform cake with blood is thrown into fire is because a new king has been born. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulder, not your shoulder. And of the increase, I'm going to jump to seven, of his government and peace there will be no end. Because his name is wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And you know we can keep on going, can't we? Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shammah, Jehovah Sneaky, we like to say, <laughs> right? Because he'll, he'll come in when you least expect it and show himself strong on your behalf, right? Isn't that awesome? He never slumbers or sleeps. He's always available. 
but he, re he, he requests us to invite him in. Yeah. Some people say, well, why didn't he just do it for me? It's not how a relationship works. Right. Yeah. Right. He's only going to come where he's invited. Yeah. And he loves the humble heart. And it, it takes a lot of humility to invite him in and admit that you need the help. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm jumping to the New Testament now because... Paul really does a great job of taking these Old Testament principles that all the Jews knew and helping them come into Christianity. And I want to just keep an eye on the clock here. Don't you love this verse in Galatians 5.1? I'm giving it to you from the Amplified. It says, it was for this freedom that Christ set us free, completely liberating us. Like, isn't that a good statement of faith? Could we just say that out loud by faith? I am completely liberated from the bondage of sin. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus set me free from the law of sin and death. That's a good declaration, church. I'm telling you, say that on a regular basis. That's Romans 8, 1 and 2, right? Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, those who are in Christ. You're not condemned anymore. Your sin has been paid for. You're not condemned anymore because the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from that sin and death. So Paul says in Galatians 5.1, he set us completely free, liberating us. Therefore, keep standing firm. There's the contending part, right? Because every day we wake up, I, I believe you should start on your knees and invite the Lord in and say the Lord's Prayer. However, you know, not religiously, but in a way that says, Lord, I need your daily bread again. I, I recognize you. Ha I'm hallowing your name. I'm worshiping you. I'm recognizing you're my king. And I don't want to be led into temptation by the world. So help me avoid every trap the enemy sets, every, every landmark. Lord, give me those night vision glasses that I can see it before I fall into that trap. And, and though he says, therefore, keep standing firm and don't be subject again to that yoke of slavery of those counterfeit affections. I've given you the power to be liberated from that. But then he warns us in verse 9, a little leaven, what? Leaven's a whole lump, just a little bit of leaven. If you saw the movie The Help, enough said. <laughs> Verse 10, somebody got it over here. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind. <laughs> That's a dad speaking, isn't it? I just told you the deal. The enemy's going to try to leaven the whole lump with just a little bit of sin. But I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will not let that leaven in. Verse 13, same chapter, but the message now. It says, God called you to a free life. Just make sure you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do. Anybody know what we call that in common vernacular now? Cheap grace. Have you ever heard of this? The fact that you're saved now means that God has to forgive you. So even if you sin, it's no big deal to God because all you have to do is ask for forgiveness. And Paul's like, no, 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 wait a minute. It's not a license to sin. The fact that you can be forgiven doesn't mean you should be loose and sloppy with your life. You're here. This is your window of opportunity. It's going to end someday. Make the most of it. This is your turn right now. Don't allow sin to cheapen you in that. He gave you a free life. Tap into it. Don't let these little foxes spoil your vine. Don't use the freedom, but what should you use your freedom for? This is powerful, and I don't think really too well understood. He's tying that freedom of that bondage being broken into the ability that we have to serve other people. He says, don't let it be an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom by falling back into sin. Instead, rather, he says, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Wow, I don't know that a lot of people would have thought that would have been the answer. And, you know, just so you know, like David and I have been cultivating some relationships with some helps ministries in the region. So this past Tuesday, I was loading food off the back of a truck, bringing it into a warehouse with other people, all the other volunteers. We were sorting it out and taking out the cabbage over here and the tomatoes and the potatoes over here. And we were putting it in bags so that later in the day when people came to pick it up, they, you know, there was a whole process. It was a beautiful thing. You could say, well, I don't know. I mean, that doesn't sound very spiritual. <laughs> it doesn't take a whole lot of Bible knowledge to do that. But it does take a commitment in your heart to understand that this law says the freedom I get means as I've been blessed, I'm supposed to be a blessing. 
right? And even though I'll never meet the person who got the cabbage that I put in that bag, doesn't matter, because we're in a kingdom. And this is the currency of the kingdom, is that we love one another as Christ loved us. And it's unconditional. It's just, I go there, and I do the work for a couple hours, and I contributed to the bigger picture of the kingdom. And people will say, like, why would you do that? It's because that's what God did for me, right? So as you give, you receive. If you never want to give anything, it's your choice. You don't have to, but it's a generous God. If you've taken out his nature, he puts it in you. And then he says, pretty profound, all the law is fulfilled in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we know that from the golden rule, right, which is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Treat other people the way you'd want to be treated. That's that same concept. But this is actually from Leviticus. This was a verse that the Jewish people knew. From Leviticus 19, 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And if you looked at, I'll just pick one at random, Luke chapter 15, verse 1, it says that Jesus was standing and talking to the tax collectors and the sinners. And the Pharisees were nearby looking and disturbed by the fact that Jesus was talking to these lowlife people, okay? Now, yeah, it is a wow, because the Pharisees were representing God, and they were looking down on these people, the sinners. And it says, this beautiful language says that the sinners were drawn to Jesus. They weren't drawn to the Pharisees. Why? Because the Pharisees were condemning them. That's what religion does. It tries to pull rank on you. So if the whole law is love your neighbor as yourself, it's the great equalizer. It's like, I'm going to treat you as another human being created in the image of God, regardless of your background, what country you're from, how much education you have. If you've got breath in you and you're a human being, you're, you're created in God's image. And if you need food, you should be able to come and get food, no strings attached. Huh. Sounds a little idealistic maybe, huh? Not what he said. If you're going to get free, use your freedom to serve one another in love. All the law is fulfilled in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus, Old Testament, 1918. Here's my instruction then. Walk in the Spirit and let the Spirit bring order to your life. That's the voice. For everything the flesh desires goes against the Spirit, and everything the Spirit desires goes against the flesh. There's a constant battle raging between them that prevents you from doing the good that you want to do. And then I just gave you a little bit of a, a commentary here that I thought was just beautifully written. So Paul makes the point that freedom is for love. Can you say that? Freedom is for love. One more time. Freedom is for love. Whoo! Powerful truth. You can't just hold on to it yourself. But basically he's saying this law is a supernatural law. It's all fulfilled in love your neighbor as yourself, but effectively you can't do it in your own strength. Because if you take the freedom to do your, toot your own horn, then you're feeding your pride. And that's not why God set you free. This is to feed the servant heart, like we have this down here, right? Jesus washing Peter's feet is the kingdom. He's the king of kings, yet he's a foot washer. And the people that have been impactful for God weren't egotistical. They weren't prideful. They were humble people. And God can pour his power through them because God knows they're not going to take it to their own account. And that's anybody. Some people are, are mightily gifted in the natural and still humble enough, and God uses them because he knows it's not going to inflate their ego. But that's a pretty big challenge, isn't it? So Paul makes the point that freedom is for love. He points to that Old Testament verse, Leviticus 19, 18, to love your neighbor as yourself as a key measure of fulfilling the Christian mission. So would you say that you know what your Christian mission is? Do you even think you have one? <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, yes, you do. And we want to help you find it. You know, I, on a general rule, we are reflecting the nature of Christ into the world. We're his ambassadors. That's a mission that all of us have. We're all called to be ministers of reconciliation. And with Christmas coming at this 2020, with the election and all the stuff that's been going on in America, if ever there was a need for a ministry of reconciliation, boy, is this it, right? But who are we going to be? Which version of this? Is it about me or is it about the Lord? 
And if I'm representing the Lord, I just kind of get out of the way and say, okay, Lord, I want to treat them the way you want me to treat them, not the way my flesh wants to react right now. It's not impossible. He wouldn't ask us to be doing it if it was. And then this man said, this all-embracing commandment can't be obeyed by emphasizing who you are according to your flesh. It can only happen by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's really a profound thought. So let's just ask the Lord right now, Lord, help me yield on a minute-by-minute on a, on a -minute basis a greater yielding to your authority and to your spirit in my life so that I could be directed by the pure energy of heaven and not my ego and not my pride trying to creep in and take back over again and take control back over again. And one, uh, John Wimber was the one who said, how pure is the fuel in my engine? Right? So if it's pride and ego driving my behavior, that's not good fuel. So we want that pure fuel of heaven running us so that our motives are only bound by the Lord's desires, not by our desires. Amen? A little louder? Thank you. Thank you. I'm almost done. Actually, yeah, just a couple more. Those of us who belong to the anointed one have crucified our old lives and put to death the flesh and all the lusts and desires that plague us. Since we've chosen to walk with the Spirit, let's keep each step in perfect sync with God's Spirit. You might be saying, well, this doesn't really sound like a Christmas message, right? But it is, because it's this gift that the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus is the gift. It set me free from the law of sin and death. And when you're out in the world talking to people, they need the same light that I saw in my mother. They need to see that you have a set of tools that's different than what they've been given by the world. And they'll try to discredit it. I tried to discredit my mother because I knew it was going to mean that I would have to change. And people don't like to change, do they? <laughs> and it's not just all those other people out there that don't like to change. It's we, too, don't like to change. And, and that's why the spirit can be a little convicting sometimes, can he? All right, so then in, at the end of 6, he says this will happen when we set aside our self-interest and we work together to create a true community. Look around, right? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a true community where we can love each other unconditionally, where you don't have to qualify to get in and, you know, hand us your resume and we'll get back to you. Jesus never said that, right? Whosoever will. Whosoever will. He hugged lepers. You weren't even allowed to touch them. He hugged them. That's our model. Woo. This will happen when we set, our, set aside our self-interest, create a true community, Instead of the culture consumed by provocation, pride, and envy, that's another day's lesson. If one of our faithful, all right, this is among our community now, if one of my brothers or sisters falls into sin, a trap, and is snared by sin, don't stand idle and watch his or her demise. Gently restore him, being careful not to step into your own snare by getting prideful and thinking you're better than that person. No, we want to love each other in this kingdom. I mean, I could tell you that when my uncle was murdered, the first thought was I was going to kill the person who I thought did it. I wasn't a Christian, right? This was the noble thing to do. I, I know now that that wasn't the person. I don't know who it was, but I know the one I thought it was isn't the one. <laughs> I would have been totally wrong. Talk about a snare of the enemy, right? But that seemed like the, the noble thing to do. It was exactly what the devil would have wanted me to do right? And keep compounding the sin. Let's stand up. So I'm going to finish on this last verse here. Can I just say Merry Christmas to you all right now? And uh, I'm sorry we won't get to hug. This is a hugging church, but it's been a hard thing with COVID not to be able to hug each other. But receive the hug in the spirit right now and have an awesome day on Christmas Day. You're all a gift to us. And uh, we just pray you have an awesome Christmas and that your finances are in good shape no matter what's going on with COVID, that you find the favor of the Lord through, through your activities. And um, I love this part. It says, shoulder each other's burdens. Can we say that out loud together? Shoulder each other's burdens. And, you know, there's other versions that say bear one another's burdens. But I like when it says shoulder because that verse in Isaiah said that that 
The enemy's rod was right on my back. I was chained to that thing. But now we come alongside and we can shoulder each other's burdens. Even, even when somebody's in a difficult time, you don't look at them and say, well, just grow up, will you? That's not a healthy community. I'm not saying you just tell them they can do whatever they want. No, but, you know, we show some compassion towards each other. Jesus looked at them and saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And he didn't have contempt for them. He had compassion on them. And that's what Paul is saying. We're to look at each other. And if somebody's going through a tough time, if they, if they lose somebody, and, and I would ask you to pray for uh, Anna Gregorian, um, has lost three family members in a very short time, including her mother and two of her aunts, all up in Boston. It was just up there. And that's devastating, right? When it's a primary person in your life, like your mom. So please keep her in prayer. There's a lot of prayer needs right now. So we're not lacking for burdens that people are carrying, but are we willing to come alongside them and say, I'm going to walk with you through this thing? That's what the loving community that the Holy Spirit drives us to. And then you will live as the law of the anointed one teaches us. What's the law of the anointed one? That the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets you free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Can you just lift your hand, receive it? Lord, I thank you that each one of us here, as followers of Christ, we receive that gift that you gave us, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's our gift today. A couple days before Christmas, we receive a fresh version of that life that you've given us. You breathe on us today. That law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will set us free from every attempt of the enemy to pull us down into sin. And let's say this out loud together. Ready? Each person has his or her own burden to bear and story to write. Mm. That's a big one, isn't it? So can you look at somebody? Say this. I'm going to help you write your story. It's going to be a really good story with a great ending. <laughs> And I'm going to look at the audience that's watching, anybody that's out there that couldn't be here today. We say that over you. We're going to help you write your story, and it's going to have a happy ending because Jesus is the author of your story, and Holy Spirit's the author of your story. And if Christmas is a difficult time for you, like it, it, it was for me for many years, again, like I don't know if you've ever heard of Joni Mitchell. She wrote hundreds of songs. She wrote one called, I Wish I Had a River to Skate Away On. And wouldn't it be just like the devil that the year my uncle was killed, that was the song on the radio. And I was sitting there parked in a car one day com contemplating doing some really terrible things. And this song comes on the radio. I Wish I Had a River to Skate Away On. And it was all jingle bells in the background and everybody else is happy at Christmas, but I'm miserable because I'm not... I'm not coming to grips with this thing. Well, we just want to pray that anybody who's feeling hurt right now because this hasn't been a good Christmas for you, we want to help shoulder the burden. We want you to be part of the community that, that's prayerful love, community of prayerful love. Reach out and ask for help. And if you don't know the Lord, like I didn't know the Lord when I was going through that pain, you can ask for him to come into your life. So we'll just say a quick prayer. You, you might not understand it fully, but you do know that the way you're going right now is not God's way. So church, I know all of you here are, are willing to pray for those people that might be watching that don't know the Lord, right? Say yes. So let's say the prayer out loud together. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I recognize there's sin in my life. I haven't been able to control it. It's been controlling me. But I heard about a law of freedom. I want to commit to Christ. I want to live in Christ and be delivered from the law of sin and death. I receive you as my Savior today. I repent of my sin. I ask you to forgive me of my sin and empower me with your spirit to walk in this new community of believers, follow you for the rest of my life, and spend eternity with you in Jesus' name. So Lord, we pray anybody that prayed that prayer today, that seed of the word of God will fall on good ground. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down a life for a friend. And if they said this prayer, that they would know that Jesus laid his life down for them. And that 
that the kingdom of God is accessible and the body of Christ is here to help shoulder burdens of one another. In Jesus' name. We love you all. We pray you have an awesome Christmas. I wish I could come and hug you all, but I can't, so receive it by faith. In Jesus' name. Have an awesome holiday, everybody.